because every time in history that there's been this huge bureaucratic thing that everyone just thinks will blow over, yeah. some dude or woman with a big mouth with an alternative yeah. opinion goes, that's enough. Yeah. For a long time, I felt the army let me down, but the answer is it's life. Sometimes you have everything and it just gets taken from you and it's how you respond to it. You can either be the fool or you can be the hero. So. And that's to my last point. You got to take the leap. Okay. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be circling back to lots of things that I know, but I'm going to, I just want to try to do this in bite sizes so that I can, I can help you as you, as you manage this. So let's just dive in. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. How are you? I'm okay. Good. You know, I want to just talk this morning a little bit with you about your work, your mission, your your life's work with founders. And it's it goes off in so many different directions that I'm I'm just gonna ask you if you would to help us understand something. What is a founder? Mm. In a lot of cases, it's someone that's unemployable. Um, in some cases, it's someone that builds things. And in the most significant, but the least amount of cases, it's just someone on the contrary. And if you bring them all together and you find someone that's all three of those things, then they won't stop because they don't have a choice. So, and go ahead, sorry. So generally I, I find that those that are the founder is that no one wants to hire them. Um, they like to build things and not allowed to build things anywhere unless they build it themselves. And they're on the contrary. They don't believe the way that something is built is providing the most value. Um, so they're willing to bet it all um, to change, to change a whole market. So before I ask you the next question, I'm just curious, how does a founder with those three extraordinary characteristics, they all sound like the characteristics of a loner, and yet founders are by no means loners, right? I mean, they're, they're, they need and use effectively collaborators to build empires. What, what is the biggest challenge for a founder with those three characteristics in dealing with the world writ large? I think they're loners. They are loners. Okay, well, that's so. How do they? How do as loners? How do they manage building, um, founding, building, and expanding? They can't do it by themselves. I don't think a lot of them do manage. I think, um, you know, let's just let's just talk about creative people. Let, if we put them in a category that they're just creative people, and the idea that everyone's creative. The, uh, if everyone's creative, then no one's creative. So if they're creative, then already their head's above the parapet to be cut off. It's like the zebras. If, there's, if you stand out, you're going to get eaten. So, you know, if they've already got a creative thing, they've got to figure out um, how to build it. So if you're a non-technical founder, you've got to find someone that will build it for you, which is extremely hard to do. Um, most products that you build are, are, are challenging, uh, whether it's a, a technical product or a content rich product, both are very hard to learn if you're not a specialist in either one. So you've got to convince followers that have really unique skills. Then you've got to build the thing and pay them. And you're going to give up a hell of a lot of your money or a hell of a lot of the, the ownership of it to someone that has money. And, you know, what else are they going to do with their money? They'll just take it elsewhere. They don't have to give it to you. 
So you have no leverage, especially when the products are not built. And then you build it and it works. And then it's like, well, we need market fit. So you've got to, you've got to build the story of what your product does. And if you're that innovative, it could just be the wrong time. Like if, if you can't search your product category on Amazon, for example, or on G2, which is a software platform, then you're too early. So you have to then build a market and you've got to found a market. And then once you've found the market, then you've got to be like, okay, now I need to sell the thing. And selling is selling an idea versus selling a product is a very different thing. You've got to worry about promotion, price, distribution. And then you've got to go, okay, um, then you've got to run sales and marketing like at an enterprise scale. And they don't need you anymore for that. No, the company doesn't need you to do that. There are better people that know how to do that. So right. there's never any peak. And in the very rare times that a sh true founder that's all those categories gets through that cycle and they launch their second business, how often do you see the C-suite standing next to them in any promotion? I doubt you've seen, you never saw Steve Jobs have anyone standing next to him. You never had Elon Musk have anyone standing next to him. You rarely have the Canvas CEO have anyone standing next to her. In the rare times, it's their second business. They're still alone. They just have way more leverage. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I think the founder journey is the same problem that creative people have, which is it's absolutely torturous to be a creative person. Yeah. And if you don't do something creative, you feel sick. Yeah. So, yeah. Like founders, the real ones, they can't stop being creative and founding new businesses. But they also know at certain points, they're not valuable. So it's like, it's like so, I'm going to do something really hard, but I know in act two that I'm going to be wiped out, but I'm going to right. keep going towards act two anyway. Right. Um, so it's, it, it, it it is, it it's easy to surmise as you, describe this this uh perilous and uh kind of hopeless but spectacular journey um where where the founder moves because the founder has to the urgency and the internal push is just non-negotiable it it begs the question why now do founders matter why do they matter If founders do their job well, the market operates more fairly after a technical invention. So if a founder does their job well, it can reset market conditions to allow for better and fairer market distribution. So the cynic in me can say that we didn't, in 2008, a lot of people didn't have a recession and a lot of people were very wealthy. And now you're seeing a huge monopolization of markets that a government policy is reacting to. And you could argue that a lot of those maneuvers aren't as fair as they could be. The technology should be improving fairness, not limiting it to a few. Um, but, and we're at the greatest point of technical evolution and acceleration. So you can make the choice and we can partner with people that want machines to manage humans or machines to create better humans. So I think, um, founders right now are extremely valuable, uh, due to the aggregation of wealth among a very small class of people and a small class of companies that have been able to harness technology to give them a sort of market gain or monopolistic market gain that hasn't been seen before because the technology didn't really exist. And I, so that's why I think they're more valuable now than they've ever is been. There a, is there a fundamental 
conflict between the founder who who in their brilliance and solitude and determination and contrariness is developing a product which will create greater access, greater get, readjust the market, and a capital markets who want to own the founder's output in order to control it. Is this a fatal uh, marriage between two parties who one needs the other's money, the other one needs the other's founding, but the one with the money gets to ultimately trump the one who founds? Is this a, is this a fatal game? Maybe. Right. So that begs a really, the, the, the question that I, that I think a lot of people want to know about you. And, and I understand there's a long and complex history and we can come to that down the line, but really in essence, we've asked what's a founder, why does they matter? Why are they so vital to you? Why are you setting your life's course to be an ally, a voice, a sword on behalf of founders. Why are they so important to you? Other than that you are one, I get it. But why, why do they matter so much to you? On a just business level, if we don't have new entrepreneurs, challenging the status quo then we'll just have really shitty products and we'll be told to use them i don't like people don't like and that has consequences people don't like the way that people are commoditized in the hiring process or are educated or the way they delivered health care or but no vote or policy changes those services Someone has to do something so unique that 10 to 100 times the value created so consumers switch. Only the entrepreneur can do that. And that's not just a founder. That's someone that wants to gain. So on a business level, we don't. We're not going to get better products and services for the future unless they challenge the status quo. On a spiritual level, I want them to be able to make mistakes without being cancelled. Because I went as far as you could possibly go to make things equal, to bring on a board of advice, to look for people that understood business, to openly state that I don't want to be the CEO from 12 months into running it. I went as far as I could go to find chairman, executives, cleaned it out twice. But I'm still the scapegoat or the person that's got to pull it all back together. So, and there's no win out of any of that. And, you know, there's a story where I got approved for a bank loan credit facility of about $5 million. And the bank was using me as marketing collateral to raise external capital before they even approved the loan. We were the fastest growing company in the region. They canceled the loan. When I did the investigation into the banking executives and I went and saw them on site, I asked like 45, I asked the same question 45 times. Like, why did you cancel the loan? And they didn't answer it, didn't answer it, didn't answer it. It was in about an hour and a half meeting. And eventually the lady said, the only reason you exist is the military felt sorry for you, so they gave you money. That's what she said. The head of credit risk for the whole state for this bank. And I said, point to me in my customer list where I get any money from defense. And they looked at the $17 million and there wasn't a line item from defense. I go, and here is a transcript from the chief of so-and-so calling my company, fuck you, fuck me. I go, in what way do you think they're helping? So, and I gave them an ultimatum to keep the division running and we'll fix it. So it's founder friendly or shut it down. And we'll do it for free. We'll change. We'll help you change your, your policy review so you can help growing entrepreneurs. 72 hours, they shut down the whole division. No email, no nothing. 
no thank you no 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 note from them so you know in that particular case it's like okay you know how many founders do i know that have lost their houses their livelihood because they've taken on these bank loans that are egregious terms to grow an idea after they've been successful and how many times have we gone further and further to find people that can help us build these things but when it goes wrong or you do something wrong it's just immediate end game you'll never build good entrepreneurs if they can't make mistakes you'll never build good ceos if they can't make mistakes um so on a real spiritual level i don't think they're the problem everyone else makes them the problem that bank made me the problem it didn't even follow its process. It didn't even follow it to a level of analyzing customer analysis. After raising money, saying I was the opposite of the problem. That's a really unique situation, but it's not that unique to a founder. Like it's like, oh, we did all of this, but you know, when we look back, lack of individual accountability or accountability means that you're the only one that's still accountable. So therefore you're the problem. I didn't. I don't think that's the way of growing successful entrepreneurs. Last question on this phase of inquiry. It's the same question I asked before, but maybe a different way. Is the, is the founder, is it individual versus system here? Is the founder ultimately an individual who has to go up against a system which un inherently fears uh, envies, dislikes individuals. Is it that? Is that too simplistic? No, it's probably what it is. Yeah. Wow. Like I said, most of them are unemployable, which right. means the system has either not accepted them or spat them out. Right. A lot of the times they're spat out because of their creative ideas. Right. Sometimes they're spat right. out because of their leadership ability. Right. Sometimes they're spat out because what's contrary is is uh it threatens the status quo so yeah so if i look at your work now i mean you're you've established your uh reputation and your brand uh in so many different ways in so many different venues as um for lack of a better word a, a founder's protector you know there's an aspect by which being uh an ally to a founder um in various stages of the journey whether that's the, the, the wise whispering of an elder or, um, or the hard daily shaping of a market or the, or the heroic deal that requires you to draw your sword and, and cut through to healthy partnership or healthy, <clears throat> healthy deals, heroic deals, which you do, all, all three of those. How does a founder, when does a founder when should a founder find you? How does a finder, how does a founder find you? And how do you start with a founder? How does it begin? I wouldn't say I have a brand with founders. Um, I would say that there's one progressing. Um, I say that as someone who's seen you in action with multiple founders, who the moment you start to engage with them and talk to them. I watch their shoulders sag. I watch their, I watch them breathe differently because all the time they're wary, all the time they're on their pins and needles for everything you've just said. They are unsafe in a system led world. They are unsafe. And the first experience they have of you, even if you're pushing hard and opinionated and strong-minded about what they're not doing, the first experience I've seen every single one of these founders have is the is the sudden and unexpected feeling of safety. That's what I mean by a brand. Okay. Um, I, I think people are people are coming to me because they used to work for me and have founded their own business. Um, so pirates creating their own pirate ship. Um, because they're looking to move to the next level um, and are looking to do a big deal, whether that's working out how to sell their 
software. So I like to teach people how to do heroic deals because I think heroic deals allow founders to keep their equity and remind people how valuable they are, much like how certain queens and kings used to have to lead at a certain point of battle that no one else could, um, whether it's their ability to see from experience or the need to show someone still willing to put everything on the line can really move people. Because there's no one that puts everything on the line in a system. It's built to be redundant. So um, that means no one has to put anything on the line. So seeing that can drive. And then um, I'm also still building things. I, I I don't think you can help founders if you're still not founding something new. Um, and I've moved from them being enterprises to being ideas. I'm not going to not run it transforming the GED. So um, so there's a campaign around doing that and that attracts people because the it's the sort of on the contrary, you know, why should you hire a high school dropout? Well, the real question is, a high school graduate's really been that valuable? It's just the wrong question. Like, it's just like, is there, you're saying that you're finding people in, say, a store that, it's a casual hourly employee that used to fly, fly a fighter jet. It's like, well, they didn't get through the recruiting process, but they're a casual employee. So, you know, um, I think that if you're seen publicly to be chasing a contrarian idea, they come towards you. I, I, they want to learn how to do a heroic deal to keep their equity. They come here and um, they that's how some founders are coming towards me, but I don't think a lot are yet. And I'm not sure if I want a lot to come towards me. It's a I used to be really optimistic. My whole business was founded on potential of people. The potential can go wrong. So it's hard to speak to a lot of these founders and see some of the things that I didn't ignore but wasn't looking for and I can see it in their interactions, their team, their numbers. And it's like, hey, someone could be lining you up here. And I think that's really inappropriate because what I found about founders is that they're some of the only people that you can give challenging advice to that the rest of the world now avoids like they can take constructive criticism at the lowest level and the highest most impactful level so you know seeing it's like oh you know we don't really think this ceo founder can do it board member a it's like have you spoke to them about it why are you telling us like it's really interesting being you know advisory room and seeing that conversation but them not having any sack to go at it and they're the same person that could be saying hey you know that was a great fiscal three years that you ran to do the hardest work to get the beachhead that was required but you might not have the skills to go next so how do we build this team around you or not with you because right. my my risk like so that's the tricky bit so i don't i'm not sure if i I want to attract a lot of them. I'm not right. I'm not certain about it because it's not this is not positive. It's not it doesn't it's to to use an overused word, it's a bit triggering. Yeah. I mean you're 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 in a tough situation because you you don't actually control that. You control the access, but the but the players are coming to you more and more and more and will continue to. And what happens to you is I've watched is that someone will come to you, a CEO of a deal, a founder will come to you, having established the beachhead and having visions of the heroic deal in their mind. And they will have skipped a middle point. And what they're thinking about is the numbers tell them a heroic deal is possible. The system is out there telling them a heroic deal is possible. Uh, their ideas are still crackling and percolating. They're still working hard as founders but they've actually skipped a middle step, which is what business am I really in? 
what am I really doing here? And who do I really want to help me? And who is actually hurting me as they appear to be helping me? All of those questions, they touch the raw nerve of your passion. You can't stand it when someone masquerades as a help when they're a hurt. You can't stand it when you see a good entrepreneur who's done hard work, who wants to, to, to go to the next step with their business, but hasn't actually had the space or safety to really determine what their business is. Those people are gonna to come to you. They're already coming to you. I can tell you as someone who's flying in the cockpit with you that they're coming and never have I seen you, even though I've seen you be uh, difficult and challenging and sometimes not listening very well, I have never experienced anyone who's met you and didn't feel like you had to be the one they needed to talk to. So I guess my question to you is, is I still, I'm not coming back to you fully yet. I'd love to stay with the founder. Why do these founders skip that middle step? Why is the, is it the need for money? Is it the need for relief because they're tired because they want to jump? How often do we see founders who just haven't really gotten to the nub of their story? And why is that? Or am I wrong? There's a lot of... Maybe I'm the voice of the system saying, lot of, you're not telling the story I want to hear. Let's, that's a lot of parts of this sort of more than one question. But maybe to yeah. start with why they skip the step. They're just optimists. Yeah. So they'll sit there. They won't see a skip step. They'll see, oh, this person gets the way we want to shape the future. So they're accelerating it. Thank God I've finally got someone that gets what I'm up to. That's why founders struggle to go from activation of a prospect to close because Getting a big enterprise customer to close is everything to do with risk mitigation, timing, marketing, and co-marketing, the story. And as a founder, you've probably only just got the story. So, um, you know, and what ends up happening is They've been able to raise capital generally off telling their story. Businesses care for about two minutes of what your personal story is. Um, that doesn't lower their risk. But for an investor, a personal story can lower their risk because their money gets con committed for 10 years. No company commits for 10 years. It's like, I want a value and I need your risk in doing, lower our risk in losing my job in doing so. So what happens... Um, is that founders are really optimistic and they see they see they see they think that they get the same optimism from the person that they're selling to when really that's just one out of the 10 things you need to cross off to get the sale done mm. with that person uh, so um, and the challenge is within a market now that's focused on impactful stories and saying things because the world wants you to say it a certain way, um, which is limitation of language or opinion. It doesn't matter where you sit. That's what's going on. Then a lot of people are going to say that your story is right just because they think they have to, not because they see value. Um and so, therefore, the, the reason they skip a sales step is that they believe what people are telling them because they only have ever built their business by trusting people before they've proven value. And two, because they actually are optimists. Okay. That's all it is. That's, that's the main reason they skip the steps. They never take time to yeah. learn the steps. And it's like, well, you know, their first few customers probably just bought into the optimism too. But that just means they were innovators. Right. And they're not early adopters or early majority. Um, so I think when you when you pair back 
uh, the founder and you keep paring those layers off and, the, and the, that beautiful opening three frames that make a founder. It feels to me most deeply like you're touching one of the core issues, which is optimism. For all the struggles that you've had in your journey uh, as a, in your childhood, uh, in your education, in your life as a warrior, in your life as an entrepreneur, in the difficulties and challenges that have been in all of those sectors of your life, harrowing, really challenging difficulties. You've never lost your optimism. I understand that you're skeptical. I understand that you're jaded. I understand that you've, you've, you've been, you've had to learn things the hard way. But your optimism is the thing I think that founders feel. And it begs a question for me. And that is, are people like, are people who are not founders, can they really speak to founders at all? I mean, I think about investment bankers and consultants and um, academics and uh, all people who are vital on the founder's journey. I get it. But in the end, aren't all these components of the founder vital for a founder to be able to feel safe and hear someone else speak to their issues? Let me add, uh, I'll address that statement that you said at the start and then I'll go to your question. Yep. Um, have I maintained my optimism the whole time? No. I lose my optimism on an hourly basis. That's not... Uh, if it's not the losing of the optimism. It's, it's, it's the, the presence it's, of it. It's, it's a create... If you're a creative person, everyone doesn't understand that your mind is a two-sided blade. That's why veterans have a lot of problems. They sharpen their cognitive ability and then they come back and they adjust to a speed that's nowhere near the speed that they're used to making decisions. But if I was to, you know, if, I, if I'm not optimistic by discipline, I will die. Let me play out an hourly conversation in my brain. Oh, there's an idea. Oh, there's a problem. There's an idea. 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 There's a problem. Why doesn't anyone else have any ideas for this problem? There is a problem that creates another idea and it just happens again and again and again. And it's constant and it's constant and it's constant. And if you don't address it, then your brain starts going, hey, man, you're pretty crazy. Hey, no one's going to like your ideas. Hey, no one's going to listen to you with this idea. You don't have any experience in this idea. And your brain is just doing that and that and that until you go to your brain. This idea is so crazy. It just might work. And then all of a sudden it flips to optimism, the same voice. So that's why I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic out of necessity, not because I believe in the power of people to get things done. I actually sort of believe the opposite which is very hard for me to explain because i've seen people be nothing but potential do extraordinary things i've gone after pushing potential over anything else and i have nothing to show for it so you know it's to answer your question about optimism if you're not creative in a positive fashion there is no way that you could be healthy, unhealthy. Like there's no way I could be healthy. And I've gone through the case of sitting alone in a room where my legs don't want to work properly and be nothing left but a husk. But I tell you what, in that husk, there's still ideas for some reason on how I wanted to improve that whole hospital. It doesn't make any sense. I have no experience in it. I have no knowledge just sitting there and observing it operate and operate and operate and see a different way of doing things. Um, so optimism is delivered by discipline. And you know, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so that's that's sort of the first statement. But on like can can people that are non-founders speak to founders? Of course. But no one ever asked them how they're feeling. 
rarely. Or what would you do in this scenario? Or, hey, you're our best thinker of creative ideas. This is a really tough problem. Do you mind having a look at it? So you can, I think what generally happens is that people generally muzzle their optimism. And then when they respond by saying, hey, look, this is what I think, it just always comes across as brash. Of course, it's going to come across as brash if you muzzle them and you don't treat them as if they're a part of the team. But I've seen... No, I haven't. I have, I've not seen someone that's a founder be treated by someone that's in charge as if they were an equal that could share information. What I have seen is someone that used to be in charge as an advisor to that new person in charge show the value of treating that person as an equal, which is an unusual thing. Right. Almost like an elder to the organization. That's when it happens, but not generally the chief. Well, the chief is in power and, and has all the blinders that bring that come along with power. So I don't I don't know. I don't know. I you know I, yeah, I don't know. I really don't. I don't I I um I spent the day yesterday with Vincent van Gogh, uh, I'm going to send you his uh, book of letters. I bought you a copy to send to you. And um, he is the most eloquent, next to you, the most eloquent voice on founders I've ever seen. And his address, his way of dressing, uh, here's an idea. No, it's not. Here's an idea. No, it's not. He says, when your mind tells you you can't paint, you must use that same mind to paint. So when you tell yourself you can't paint, you start to paint. Or he says, you must start by experiencing what you want to express. Uh, These seem to be fundamental to a founder's mind because they don't trust anything they haven't experienced and they need to experience uh, in order to build, to found, to go. But I guess a question for you is... How how do you manage um, what is very likely um, a flood tide of, of founders who have no one really to speak to somewhat by their own design because they are contrarians, they are loners, uh, they're unemployable. Uh, we, we're, this is not a pity party for founders. They, they themselves, the thing that makes them strong is the thing that makes them needy. Um, how do you uh, create a discipline to access? I mean, are you focused on industries? Is it, is, what is the role? What is your role in the world right now in a time of great crisis for founders? choosing where to put your energy. How do you make that call? I don't know how to make that call yet because I'm still learning where I sit in regards to them and what I know and what skills I have. Um, And I'm also not sure some of the things I know are the right things. So... It's very hard to run a, like a salesperson, run a qualification process on who to work with. Um, My main qualification process on who to work with at the moment is, do they speak to customers? And are they open to learn new things? Because if they've been muzzled so much and they don't learn anymore, they're gone. There's no, you can't help them. You can't. How do you recognize a learner? They ask you what you think. They don't try to just respond to what you say. You you can tell which founders have spent a lot of time in sales or their product and engineering teams because in engineering, um, they like to discuss the hypothesis of things 
alternatively before they build it if they're a very good engineering team. And it's not anything other than just the process. They're not being argumentative. It's how they're taught. And you always get more efficiency in your original answer even if you don't go down an alternative. And then they go do it. In sales, if you don't listen, you get your ass handed to you. So, um, so you find that the you know they know how to ask questions that drive safety. Like, if I understand, you know, like you get onto a call and they'll tell you this won't work. A great founder will say something like, "What's the one reason it would work?" And that type of questioning is someone that's realizes their place, hasn't stopped learning, and doesn't treat their opponent as an enemy. They know how to do it. So you can tell if their founder is still in the game by do they speak to customers uh, and are they willing to learn? Can if, Can founders teach non-learners to learn? Or is it really that founders really just have to make sure they spend their time with learners? Because I'm asking that question because the characteristics of the founder, the loner, the contrarian, the one who, who is unemployable, who has to stick with an idea, who lives inside the back and forth all the time. It would seem to me that their engagement with non-learners is catastrophic. Uh, and to ask them to try to teach those non-learners to be learners requires a kind of patience and an, and an attention that why would they give it? You don't know whether a fucking person can learn or not. Is, is the founder best kept safe from non-learners? Yep. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I used to be the other way and I can tell you it has given me no benefits. I would say that as a founder, your job is to qualify whether they're learners or not. You can take the approach of, you know, I don't trust anyone. You have to earn my trust. Or you can take the open-minded approach of a learner, which is you have my trust is up for you to lose. So I'm going to consider you a learner until you're not. Until you show me that you're not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I do not, I argued, you know, I, I argued for the opposite because I grew up in a world where I was in the military. Now, the military is one of the largest bureaucracies that you can be in, but there is a common sort of um, anecdote in the military that there's the army that goes and the army that stays. And a lot of people that are the army that goes aren't the people where they are, that they can stay and they just can't do it. There's two armies is sometimes described in uniform. I didn't really get it, but what I sort of realized is the people that conduct missions that get put in a box, that go do what they're designed to do, and they're people that operate the bureaucracy. And they are two different types of people. Right. And in times even of war, the type of people that, that turn up are very different to the types of people that operate it when they're not. So there's always this continuous shift between the warrior class being in industry and shifting into war and then coming back. And there are very few Jedi type people that are just like, they're going to be the warrior no matter what. And, you know, they've, they've got a natural pedigree to of no neuroticism, but I, I, so, but the army has this model of everyone can learn. No, 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 right. no. You, you, everyone can learn what the army teaches you. And a lot of the time, none of that is valuable. The army teaches you drills. When you work out that the army teaches you drills to give the commander time to respond, and that is it. Right. Right. The rest is just the response. Right. Then you realize that you're not in a learning organization. You're in an organization that's preparing itself to engage something that you have to learn when you're on the ground. And great commanders realize that. They don't, they do their own learning outside of the military. Uh, you know, no one taught it's us. It's interesting to, to me to hear the work. metaphor for me of what you're saying is I interviewed hundreds of prisoners of war in World War II, POWs in World War II. And, and everybody had the same experience that the way they were treated on the battlefield, the greatest care and greatest attention 
they got on the battlefield was from the enemy that was right in front of them. And every mile away from the front that they were marched as prisoners, the treatment got more and more brutal. The further you got from the front. And by the time you reached the city, they were being beaten, smacked, you know, treated terribly uh, compared to the front lines where they were given coffee, told to sit quietly. Um, so it's, it goes to your point about this gradation of from warrior. There are two armies. There are, and and it and it's a very relevant metaphor. It seems to me in this founder world because one of the things that I notice that you do in in bringing that founder's voice is you, you, you know it's not a, it's not immediately clear to non learners how you work. It 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 can be abrupt. Uh, it can be directive. Uh, it can be assertive. But I realized that thinking back on it, that the direction and the assertion um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the decisiveness is a way of trying to establish clear boundaries for where a safe camp is. I've not heard you be that way once you get further in. Uh, I, I've noticed how you then begin to allow the the entrepreneur the founder to make mistakes um i think this is a very important capacity to protect the founder from non-learners because most of the non-learners are the ones with capital who are going to invest in them and therefore they're you're bringing a fox into the hen house and it doesn't mean that you don't have you have you don't bring the fox in but you can certainly establish some ways that the chickens can stay safe from the fox. Um, but it's a very powerful, it's a powerful skill and it's a powerful, it's powerful work in the world. Mm. Um, I want to acknowledge that we're coming up on, on the end of the hour and, I, and I'd like to ask for your permission to, to do this a couple more times because I think it would be helpful in the next hour when we schedule it soon to kind of, walk through the story, your own journey, uh, the, the personal journey, because I think it is very important to see the real root system of this work you're doing, where it really comes from. And I think I knowing uh, uh, some of this story quite well, I, I think it's very relevant. Uh, and, it, it, and within it, baked within it, uh, are many of the lessons that I know the book you're working on is going to articulate very, very well for founders, because I think in some ways what you're imagining in the in the in the work that I've read is the ability to use your experience as teachable moments um, for founders who are who have very few allies to to turn to. So if you if you give me the go ahead, we'll we'll schedule another hour and we'll we'll. Um, We'll go at it. Cool. What are you feeling at the moment? I'd, I'd like it to end. So it's tricky. It's unfortunately necessary. And I don't want to do it. It's that simple. And what is it that makes you not want to do it? You're tired? Uh, when you start to box, you... The punches don't hurt as much. And then they start to hurt. And then slowly, as you fight more and more and more, you become immobilized in certain parts. So then you have to adjust the way you fight. And then eventually, you know that there's only a few fights left. And the more you fight, the more you have to lose because you know that you don't, you know, you're immobilized. There's only, there's less directions that, there's less opportunity for a win to occur. 
Now, that's all well and good if you want to fight to the end. Like Tom Brady's a good example. He wants to play. He has choices. He doesn't need to. It's really hard to keep fighting when you're immobilized. You know what the sting of the punch is going to be. And there's no chance of winning. So it's uh can you say does does there's no chance of winning? Is winning ending? Or well you can't win in this in these fights? <laughs> is there such a thing as winning? Well Oh, winning like his peace. Like for me, his peace. I want peace. Right. I don't right. want to fight anymore. But right. you know, now the world's sort of pulling all these people to me. You go, hey, you know, you just been fighting for the wrong tribe. It's like, well, how many times do I have to keep fighting for the wrong tribe? Like it's like it's it's a real. Yeah. It's it's back to the equation of if you know that the only thing you can be is creative, and if you're not creative, you're you you're sick. But if you are in the process of creative getting attacked the whole time and knowing that it's coming and you can still only be creative, it never stops. So it's like a, it's like being encased in a prison that you didn't select, nor did you do the crime for. You're just that way. So I don't, no, 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 never, never have I ever have I walked into a conversation ever where it was like, hey, that guy was really valuable. In every room that I walk into, it doesn't matter what. There might be one person that might whisper that. There might be one person that will say it afterwards. But someone will go, that guy's crazy. I don't trust him. Why is he so interested? There's never, like, that all happens. If you know that you're going to go into that every day, hours a day, and be careful in how you maneuver, then I can tell you right now, you don't, you don't want it. Like you, you want it to stop. And yeah. you know, when you realize that some people don't have an internal dialogue, it's like, how were they so lucky? You know, it's not a, I would love to not have an internal dialogue. It's a, um, you know, I feel safe. I can't tell people how I feel because it makes them feel unsafe. It's like, that's a really tough thing that you're feeling. I don't want to deal with that. Okay, well, fuck. You asked me to tell you how you feel. So, you know, you're in a, it's a tiring to enter the ring again and again when you're getting worse and worse in the ability and how you can fight. Um. But you see no way of winning the championship. So I'm tired. So can I ask you a question? What What is the way in which you could arrive at peace? What is the way in which what would what what needs to happen for you to to arrive at peace to 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 win the match and sit down as a champion and then talk about how to fight like a champion? What what do you, what needs to happen? What's the way it could work? I'd love to just go one day of people saying, I see you. What are you thinking? One day. One day. I don't see it. I don't I don't see it happening. Like I don't, I don't. Um and I don't, I'm not trying to be a victim in this regard. I don't think that the problem that I'm facing individually is not a problem that creative people face or anyone that's tried to be on the contrary's face. I'm just saying that everyone has a limit and those limits are different. And, um, do you know what I hear you saying? Yeah. No, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I hear you saying I need to be around learners. I don't 
doubt it, but I also am very scared of what can happen now because I'm also a very large man that can have a quite physical appearance that can come across as the enemy as being described by a lot of the Western world. And there's a real sort of conversation of what's the point? You know, it, usually when there's artists, right, there's an artist, they even have a small group of fans, you know, or a musician. There's always a small group of fans. I'm not quite sure if that's the same for those entrepreneurial endeavors that involve money. Because the idea of someone having a lot of money or the capitalist ideal is that is another idea that's under threat at the same time. Like it's a it's the idea is under threat. And I, so it puts you in a really tricky situation of, you know, the masculine sort of combat type of man is under threat. The capitalist ideal is under threat. And the creative ideas are always under threat. So like I'm not quite sure if you know, if you look at some of the successful founders, they're not these huge guys that have gone and done really crazy stuff. They're like introverted technologists that invented stuff in their back room that never really wanted to, that give the appearance of them never wanting to hurt anyone. You know, they're the ones that were put in charge of these huge systems and to the point where two of them were just going to have a cage fight in public, like, and then never were going to go through it because to get in the ring of cage fighting, you got to be willing to die. Like that is the way that the match is built. And I can tell you, I'm not willing to get in the cage fighting ring. Because yep. like, I'm like, it's like, it's you got to be willing to die to do a cage fight. It's not boxing. And so that's a different type of human. And the, the guys that I know that are girls and guys and girls that are like that, masculine ideal doesn't mean you have to be male. Um, They didn't, they're not going to, they don't, they learn the power of death, so they try to avoid it. It's a different type of person that does that. So, I I don't I don't know. I, I really I really don't. Like I, I I've learned that a good strategy in some of these situations is to just give it a bit more time. So, you know, when it gets bad, it's just maybe we should just give this a bit more time and. You know, that seems to sort of work. But I don't know. I don't know if the character of which I've made up and become has that path. I really don't. And I say that objectively. Like sure, I, sure. Look, I mean, you're talking to a guy who, who after yesterday, uh, was looking at an artist who had no no small base of fans mm. committed himself to an institution for a year where he painted 150 of his greatest paintings came out of that institution and killed himself five months later because he had no uh, small band of yes of allies mm -hmm. and i i get it and i also know you and i know whether or not you see them seeing you, you are weekly building a cadre of people who see you. Um, and they have to learn how to learn to be with you and to see you. It's a learning process because not everyone's a founder. Um, but I, I, you, you are not alone. And the interesting thing is, you need that small band of supporters, enthusiasts, whatever. I can't remember the word you used. It was great. Um, but you need that small band because the rest of the founders are needy. And the, and the, and the neediness is going to come at you and talk to you like somebody who has something to give them. And what you need is people around you who can give you, that you can get from. How are you feeling is getting from, not giving out. So I think the the challenge ahead, I love the answer. You know, what what's the reason by which it would work one day in which you're seen and asked how you feel? That's a that's an aspiration that that the system should explore. And I, I like 
I like the challenge to me and to everyone else who is your ally. Yeah. So, and but how many of those people recognize that I'm on a tightrope? I don't think I don't think many people at all, Tom. I think what they feel, remember, everybody knows everything. All people know everything. It's what people are able or willing to tell themselves they know, which is where life takes place. If you're in a circle and someone has a dying father, the whole circle knows it. They don't know what it is. They can't name it. But they, they know something terrible is in the circle and they don't know what it is. So they know the urgency of your tightrope by being with you. But they don't know the cost because you're big and you're strong. And you've got a good voice and a loud voice and an experienced voice. And so they will project onto you all the things actually that you're not. You are, I happen to know you as one of the most tender people I know. People would find that startling. You're deeply emotional. One of the most emotional people I know. People would find that startling. What people can and can't take on is theirs, not yours. The question is, how do you find, as the founders are finding you, how do you find the founders and the learners that can stand around you and not say, oh, well, you know, Tom, you know, Tom's, you know, Kemp's hyperbolic. You know how he is. He's always talking about this and that. Well, you know, take him in increments, take him in increments. That's been my life, all my life. You know, too intense, just little bits. You know, he goes a little too far. I get it. My, my, my journey now is is uh, I have to realize that it's who I spend my time with to see myself that matters, not all the others, because they're going to say that under every conceivable condition. But this is very helpful to me. And as an example, just so you know, I interview you and I am the learner. I am getting, gaining the, the wisdom and the insight here. And uh, I think that's part of your gift and why we need to extend this and expand this. I would be really... Uh, happy if you could send me a copy of this interview. I think you should send a copy to to uh, Morgan and Taylor and, and Vicky. I mean, I should. I, I think they should see this as we go. It's very powerful, very interesting, very important, and I realize very vulnerable. But you, you, you are, you are, you are safe here. So, or you're the only one who can call that one. So never let me retract that. But anyway, thank you for the time. And thank you. I don't. I'm not sure if I'm safe. Yeah. I don't think I have a choice. Yeah, I withdraw the comment. Sorry. I that was that was just a Oh, I don't I, I think I'm I, I just want to make a point. Like I don't I don't think a lot of these founders have choice. I think yeah. they have to do the work that they're doing. Yeah. Um, that's right. I think that's, that's what right. the real problem is. I think no one recognizes that there is no there's no choice. For Vincent Van Gogh. None. And he says it over and over and over again. I have no choice. And the real problem is if you have no choice and you have the intellectual power to know that people make choices and you can't make them, that's when it becomes extremely hard to deal with. Like you, it's just like, oh, okay, so I don't, uh, you know, people consider founders players where I'm just like, I don't think we have a choice. I don't, I think this is the track that we now have to run and um, and it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it doesn't. And yeah, I. it's very hard to make sense of it. I don't think anyone really has ever made sense of it. My friend, let me, if you hear me in any moment in your life, hear me now, just this one moment. You are making sense of it slowly but surely you are making sense of it and that is part of why you're on the planet and why you stay here and do the work because you have no choice but you have the intellectual capacity to help people understand what it feels like to have no choice so thank you for that thank you for helping me see it